we're gonna take a we're gonna take a brief interlude in in some acoustic theory, and we're gonna talk about Helmholtz resonance, uh, and I'll show you how to make a Helmholtz resonator uh, or absorber or diffuser. It depends on how you look at it and what kind of terminology you want to use. Uh, Helmholtz resonance or wind throb is the phenomenon of air resonance in a cavity. That's all you got to know. Such as when one blows across the top of an empty bottle. Uh, Helmholtz, history, history. Helmholtz, Helmholtz described in his 1862 book, way before even I was born, on the sensations of tone, an apparatus able to pick out specific frequencies from a complex sound. The Helmholtz resonator, as it is now called, consists of a rigid container known as a volume. Volume. We've talked about that in, 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 in 3D, 3D modeling. <laughs> uh, nearly spherical in shape, with a small neck and a hole at one end. You know, a bottle. Uh, but the principle of Helmholtz resonation uh, is not entirely constricted to this spherical idea as we see in this in this image here. Uh, it can be used as it, it can be it is often used as a uh, acoustic treatment uh, for bass diffusion uh, or specific frequency diffusion. Uh, depending upon the characteristics of a room. Uh, so you see in this image, uh, let me make it big, there's several different volumes and several different apertures or openings. And when sound enters into this, a particular frequency within this volume is going to be accentuated, accentuated, or diminished de depending on the volume depending on the volume audio is a physical thing uh, it, it 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 is material somehow virtual in a sense we don't we hear it but we don't see it but that doesn't mean that it's not a, an incredibly physical thing it exists in the world. So, what is this, you might ask? This is the beginnings of a Helmholtz resonator I am making for acoustic treatment in my studio. Uh, what is it? It is a stack of um, uh, shipping pallet risers, junk that I found on the street, as usual. And what do we got here? We have apertures, we have openings. So the wave, sound wave of a certain frequency, refer back to the diagrams I showed you earlier, uh, that actually fits in physically through this hole. If that's the wavelength, <laughs> it will penetrate. And then behind this, I will put some uh, uh, fiberglass, and, uh, and a, what's called a loose membrane uh, uh, resonator. So a th a th something thick uh, uh, and dense like tar paper or rubber uh, loosely mounted so that it's not acting as a drum skin, you know, boing, boing, boing. It's actually taking the sound and diffusing that energy. Uh, so what are these? You know, I just found them over the course of time. What are these? They're pallet risers. I glue them together. They're made of uh, uh, particle board, you know, ground up, recycled uh, um, wood product uh, with some glue. And, and so what's interesting, what is, well, everything's interesting, but what is particularly interesting here is that the roughness of this front surface because it's made out of particle board and it's like kind of fuzzy it's going to take the high frequencies the little frequencies because these are little pockets 
right? And it's going to diffuse them, but it's going to take the frequency. I'm not sure what, what frequency it is yet. I'll, I'll measure it. Uh, but whatever frequency likes to go through these holes, it's going to take that frequency and, and uh, eradicate it and remove it. So, so is, I'm just building this because, oh, okay, I think it's, it's a good idea. Uh, but then I, I will measure this and see what frequencies it diffuses and reflects based on the front surface of this material and which frequencies does it absorb based on the size of the aperture and the materials that, that I end up putting behind this. Uh, and so then I will get an idea of its acoustic properties and then if I go into a room and say, oh, there's the, 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 the frequencies between uh, um, uh, 5 kilohertz and, and 10 kilohertz are too strong, um, we have, a, we have a, a, a spike in that uh, audio spectrum. Uh, oh, maybe I just, if I just put this in place, it'll make that more of a linear response. And in audio, that's what we're always looking for when we're, when we're just trying to get very scientific about it and very neutral about it. We want, to, we want to achieve a very flat linear response because once we have that flat linear response, we can take that into software or into uh, analog processing or whatever uh, and then change that curve, that graph, the way we want it to be as opposed to being stuck with a spectrum, with a, a range of frequencies that we then are fighting with to try to tame this one up here at, at, at um, 5k hertz and boost what's down here at 100 hertz. Uh, if you have an absolutely flat signal and then you use digital EQ that any software has or, or analog EQ if you're a fancy guy like me, uh, you can then sculpt the sound to exactly what you want uh, as opposed to fighting with the sound to get it to fit your needs. That's the purpose of audio treatment in any studio situation, whether it be in your bedroom or in uh, a professional studio. Uh, it's, it's to achieve the sound that you want and it's physical. You can understand these principles and you can actually design and build a space, even if it's just in your bathroom or in a closet, that is incredibly useful for audio capture uh, based on what, your, what are your needs and desires and, and your taste, your artistic taste. How would you like it to sound?